This is Tech Talk with Borna, episode 295, Facebook Decline, Letterbox Edition. Welcome to Tech Talk with Borna. This technology podcast covers tech news and reviews for the entire week. And now here's your host, me, Buona McCall. Greetings, folks, and welcome to episode 295 of Tech Talk with Buona. we got a great show lined up for you. I've been gone for a minute. Uh, it's been about 648 years. Uh, I managed to age a little bit. Got a little bit of a gray hair under the chin and on the brain. But uh, it's been a little bit since Tech Talk with Warner was produced. I think the last episode was sometime in 2017, back when the internet was in black and white. But we're back. We're back. we got a few stories we want to talk about. I'm actually recording this live on my Twitch stream at twitch.tv slash Buona. We're here with a bunch of folks watching me talking to a microphone. They're giggling. They don't know what's going on, but they're giggling. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we got, I, just, I just was looking at some stories. I was like, let me just record an impromptu. Tech Talk with Buona. And thinking back, that's exactly how Game Chat with Buona started. I was like, hey, guys, let's just call this Game Chat with Buona. And uh, speaking of Game Chat with Buona, you do know I have a little podcast called Game Chat with Buona. It's over there on Buona.tv slash podcast. We're going to be setting up a feed for this again. Um, I've got to dig up all the MP3 files and try to get as much as I can in terms of the content from the old shows over here to the new feed. Or I may just start from this and like I did with Game Chat 1 and just start with this episode and go forward with that. Well, without further ado, let's get started with the news. And for our first story, we're going to talk about a very, very serious Windows exploit. And uh, this has to do with Google Chrome and Windows 7 primarily, according to the article over on ArsTechnica.com. There isn't much worry for Windows 10 users, but Windows 7 users... There's an unpatch, uh, that, unpatched flaw in Windows 7 that could cause someone to take over your machine and do some really nasty stuff through Google Chrome. And uh, I'm going to have an accompanying article from Google, which is basically calling out Microsoft saying, y'all need to get on the good foot and start patching Windows 7, even though you know support is going to end, I think, in January 2020. Uh, this is a still unpatched exploit that people are starting to take advantage of. So this is an article over on Ars Technica, and it reads, Unidentified attackers have been combining an exploit for the unpatched local privilege escalation in Windows with one for a separate security flaw in the Chrome browser that Google fixed last Friday. While that specific exploit combination won't be effective against Chrome users who are running the latest browser version, the Windows exploit could still be used against people running older versions of Windows. Google researchers privately reported the vulnerability to Microsoft in keeping with its vulnerability disclosure policy. So they're going to talk about the details of it, the flaw. It resides in the Windows Windows, I'm sorry, the Windows Win32K.sys kernel driver. Just the name alone makes me think that this is nasty. It gives an attacker a means to break out of security sandboxes that Chrome and most other browsers use to keep untrusted code from interacting with sensitive parts of the OS. And so looking at Google's response, it is, it is pretty harsh. Uh, I think, I don't think they're holding any punches here. <laughs> Says to re on Wednesday, we reported this thing affecting Google Chrome and another windows vulnerability. We strongly believe I'm going to go to the fourth paragraph. We strongly believe this vulnerability may only be exploitable on windows seven, but it could be versions of it that could appear in newer versions as windows. Uh, to date, we have only observed active exploitation against Windows 7 32-bit. So they're basically telling Microsoft, you know, this is happening in Windows 7, but it possibly can happen, you know, in, <laughs> in other versions of Windows. Um, I don't know how to feel about this because I know Google's doing their due diligence and reporting this. Microsoft is sunsetting Windows 7 as a result of just it being old. You know, we've got Windows 8, Windows 10 pretty much dominating the scene for Microsoft's priority meter. Uh, so I wonder if Microsoft is already starting to move resources away. I kind of feel bad for them, even though this is something they should fix. I kind of feel bad for them. They're probably already moving resources off of Windows 7 onto other stuff, and they, they might have to ramp up to get this thing fixed. It's a, it's a, kernel, it's a kernel level exploit. Um, and that ain't something you can fix overnight, I don't think. At least I'm, I'm, 
It's a no pointer D for D reference at the kernel level. Uh, you know, I think a lot of that stuff may be already fixed in Windows 10. The, the point I'm trying to make is that here you got an OS that's about to be unsupported unless you pay for it. A, a hefty fee, I, I, from what I understand. Here's a here's an OS that's about to be sunsetted, and a big bug comes out months before you're about to sunset it. Like something that could possibly take months of development work. I don't know how long this is going to take. Google's doing their due diligence. I applaud them for that. But Microsoft's being put in between a rock and a hard place to the point to where they may have to extend Windows 7 support, which could be a huge cost. So from a business perspective, I don't, I, I don't know what they're going to do. From a u end user perspective, from someone who uses the OS and doesn't care about all that money and stuff, they need to fix it. <laughs> yeah, you, need to, you need to fix it, period. That's, that's the bottom line. It needs to get fixed. So we're going to be watching this one very closely because it, it could, it, I mean, this is a really nasty exploit. This is like owning a system. Back in the day, we called it pwn for you young kids out there. We called it pwning a system. It's pretty low level. and You can do just about anything you want once you get a system uh, exploited with this. Check it out, guys. Over on Ars Technica, they got the details over there. Also, Google on their Google blog, talk about it. I'll put the links in the show description. You can check it out. Zero day exploit. Being currently exploited in Windows 7, but possibly could lead to exploits in the newer Windows OSs as well. And for our next story, we're going we're gonna to come from the department of the Buona didn't know this department. Even if Buona didn't know this, he didn't know this. Did you know that, that, that people can track your browser size? You probably did know that, but they use it to fingerprint your profile, essentially to track you across the web. This article comes from ZDNet.com, and it's entitled Firefox to add Tor Browser Anti-Fingerprinting Technique Called Letterboxing. Huh. So this is something that's been going on way back since 2015, and I'm surprised I didn't know about it. But let me read the article to you a little bit. Mozilla is scheduled to add a new user anti-fingerprinting technique to Firefox with the release of version 67 scheduled for mid-May this year. Advertising networks often sniff certain browser features, such as window size, to create user profiles and track users as they resize their browser and move across new, York, new URLs and browser tabs. Called letterboxing, this new technique adds gray spaces to the size of a web page when a user resizes the browser window. The general idea is that letterboxing will mask the window's real dimensions by keeping the window width and height at multiples of 200 pixels and 100 pixels during, <laughs> during the window resize operation, generating the same window dimensions for all users and then adding a gray space at the top, bottom, left, right of the current page. I had no idea that they were profiling your window browser size and as you move, move across different URLs, you resize your browser. This is this is weird. Like what what possible what 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 cop, what possible situation could you use that for? Like well we found that when we play our diaper commercial that 75% of our users resize their browsers from 1024 by 768 to 800 by 950. Uh, this data supports the technique that we're using, supports, and not only endorses, but also encourages one to buy diapers. We will be in further using this data to promote it during our coffee campaign. Uh, we're going to be selling used coffee grounds that you can put on the ground and you can shuck and jive and dance to your favorite video on MTV.com. And when you do, we're going to see if you resize your browser during said shuck and jive. I, I don't get it. I, I don't get why they would do that. Like what? Poss I mean, this is cool. All right, let's 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 talk about the story. This is cool. Mozilla is adding some stuff that the Tor browser has, which is awesome. You know, I'm all for that. I'm glad that they're doing that. But I just didn't know why fingerprinting, this this whole fingerprinting existed. Like, I, I'm really curious. Like, I, I'm really, I'm really curious. And according to some people in chat, I've been told that uh, it's a setting in the Brave browser as well, which is good because Brave does have some Tor browser features in it. I, I just don't know. This is weird. This is this is the department of the weird department. Check it out, guys. Over on ZDNet.com, Firefox, Firefox, Firefox to add Tor browser anti-fingerprinting technique called letterboxing. And I didn't even know this existed. Check it out.
And for our next story, we're going to talk about Facebook. Ooh, Buona, you're about to get on the sandbox, aren't you? I can feel it. Tech Talk with Buona hasn't been a thing in 20 years, and you're just itching. No, I'm okay. But check this out. U.S. users are leaving Facebook by the millions, according to Edison Research. Now, that's an, that's that's a good headline, you know. That's cool. That's cool. Uh, according to the article, all the bad press about Facebook might be catching up to the company. New numbers from Edison Research show an estimated 15 million fewer users in the United States compared to 2017. The biggest drop is in the very desirable 12 to 34-year-old group. Marketplace Tech got a first look at Edison's latest social media research. Now, this, this, this article is cool because it shows some meaty data based on demographic. When I saw the headline, my very first question was, what are the demographics? What, what's going on with the demographics? What, what's, what's going on? And I, I scrolled down and, and lo and behold, I saw demographics. Ages 12 to 34. They break it down on Facebook usage. Based on the year, 2017, 79 million, 2018, 67 million, 2019, 62 million. The most interesting thing was looking at my demographic, which is age 35 to 54. It pretty much is flat. Like nobody's joining and nobody's leaving or it's like identical. The people joining are equal to the people leaving. Uh, 72 million in 2017 and then it drops to 69 million in 2018 and it's still 69 million in 2019. Then you got the older folks, age 55 plus, 49 million in 2017, 49 million in 2018, and it has increased. The only demographic to increase on Facebook is the age 55 plus. This is very interesting data because the young folks are getting off. They're jumping over to Instagram, which is one of the things I was going to point out. There's a graph shows about which social media brands are used most often based on year. And this graph actually depicts social media. Uh, it depicts Facebook declining and it depicts Instagram increasing and everybody else is pretty much stagnating except for uh, uh, Snapchat. Snapchat is growing as well. So the old guard of Twitter and just Facebook, you know, these new guys are coming in. This is probably why Facebook bought Instagram and all these people are being acquired because they recognize that. But I can't help but look at this and go, Facebook is still a vast majority of social media users. Like, it's shocking. 52 million in 2019 versus only 16 million on Instagram and 13 million on Snapchat and 5 million on Pinterest and 5 million on Twitter. Twitter and Pinterest are at the bottom. And then you got 9 million other. They're at the bottom. And I use Twitter the most. I use Twitter and Discord to communicate with everybody. And it's just like, it's, a, it's just a staggering how many people in 2019, even though a lot of information about Facebook is out there, about what they're doing with your data, what they're doing, they just can't, they just can't get off of it. They're still on Facebook. And I think that's probably why Mark Zuckerberg was drinking that water and looking crazy in that hearing. He's just like, you, you guys, you're wasting your time. I got them. I got these people. They're not going anywhere. I, I really believe he he probably felt that. He's like, we got this. We can, okay, we're going to lose like, I don't know, 50 million people or whatever, but we're still going to have 80 million. And I think I saw a, re a related article. I don't know what the exact number was, but the, the, the valuation of Mark Zuckerberg's value or his value went, went like down by multi-millions in the past couple of years because, you know, Facebook's value has gone down, apparently. So he's losing money, but... I mean, if you got $20 and you lose a quarter, I mean, you'd be like, all right, I I'm okay. Or no, not even a quarter. If you lose like two cents of your $20 that you got, you're like, oh, you know, it it's like a very small percentage of what this man's worth. He's losing. He probably doesn't even care. But I just find it astounding that the older demographic is flocking to Facebook, whereas the younger generation is going away. And, and my demographic is just chilling. Maybe, I don't know, maybe this data in here, I have a suspicion this data is denoting people who delete their Facebook account as leaving because I haven't used Facebook and I don't know how long. I just don't log in. My account's still there. I haven't touched it. I don't do anything with it. I just don't log in because I know that if you log in, that's when they track you. Um, so I don't log in. 
and maybe they're tracking it that way. Maybe if I go and delete my Facebook account, it'll remove it from this list, this data that they bought from Facebook, by the way. <laughs> I don't know, man. I just don't see Facebook as being relevant anymore. I think it, it did its part. There were some good things that Facebook did that I'm proud of them for. Um, and there are some things that Facebook did that I, I, I just can't stand. And I, I think they should be called out for. That's why I don't use them. It, it takes me back to my friend feed days when I was a big user of a, of a social media called friend feed. I made a lot of friends over there. I was very active. I was on there all the time discussing all kinds of stuff. You would, if you know, if you see how I use social media today and versus how I used it back then, you wouldn't believe it. You're like, that's Buona. Yeah. I was all over the place talking about every little thing that I can get my face on. And Friend feed was purchased by Facebook and I just could not believe it. I was like, this is the worst possible situation that could ever happen. This is the social media company that I hate and loathe the most buying the social media company that I love the most. And essentially that's history. That's how it all happened. And now years later, Facebook has gotten even worse and I'm stuck on Twitter and using discord, you know, as my social media. Check it out, guys. Very interesting stats. I mean, the fact that people are leaving Facebook, to me, is interesting. But I think the breakdown of demographics of who's leaving and, you know, possibly why is even more interesting. And we're going to be watching this very closely over the years. I can't wait to hear about 2020 and 2021, how many people are still leaving or coming back to Facebook and what new social media darling will pop up by then. Check it out, guys. This is over on Marketplace.org. They got the details over there. And for our next story, we're going to talk about you millennials. Did that trigger you? The Generation Zs. Gen Generation Z Zs. This article over on USA Today is judging you millennials. How do you feel about that? Hmm? Hmm? <laughs> Let me stop. I'm going to make you upset before I even read the article. This article says, connected with thousands of friends, but feeling all alone. Mm, millennials and Generation Z. I don't even know what age group is what anymore. Like Millennials, Generation X, Z, Y, 4, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Burrito, Kappa. I don't even know. But this article talks about the idea of this new generation uh, suffering from mental health issues and that the separation of, well, I, this is my interpretation of it is that there's a lot of people who think they have thousands of friends, but it's actually the exact opposite. So this is the article. One of the nation's busiest places or buzziest places, the Texas capital ranks as many of the best lists. Um, well, that's not the paragraph I want to read. Oh, yeah, it is. Uh, but Wilton wasn't feeling it. He lived near the University of Texas at Austin, but wasn't a student. Walking through the social megaplex that is UT Austin, was intimidating said with almost 52,000 students all seemingly having fun. And he says, you definitely feel like you're on the outside. It's hard to penetrate that bubble. And this is Connor Wilton, a 24, 24 year old single guitarist who knew zero people in Austin and felt lonely at first. And this article goes on to say loneliness with his well-documented ill effects on health have been called an epidemic and a public health threat especially among the elderly. But analysts are now learning that always connected social media mavens in the country's younger generations are also dealing with this thing called loneliness. So here, here's, here's the, my thoughts on this. Cause we were kind of discussing this on the stream while I was getting prepared. I was talking about just the importance of social interaction, especially growing up when your brain is malleable and you're developing who you are, your personality, your likes, your dislikes, you're, you're very, you're a very influenceable creature coming up. And I was talking about just the benefits of dealing with other people, how much it can do for you. And there's a lot of people who just don't like being around people, but have benefited from being around people. Like they, they have negative feelings and negative thoughts and stuff like that, but they're able to interact with others and they're able to adapt and adjust. And it makes them a better person overall. Because you have to deal with multiple personalities in real life in multiple forms. You've got body language. You've got scent, sight, smell, all types of senses, voice, intonation, all these things you have to deal with to kind of read a person or not read a person that you don't get when you talk to them online. 
Now, somebody like to say, oh, boy, no, that's that's wrong. You know, online interactions are exactly the same as physical, but better. I'm like, well, you know, that's that's debatable. But I'll, I'll, I'll just I'll just say it's OK to be wrong um, <laughs> because physical and social interaction is something that I think children need to do. Like you, the, being separated from others, especially people in your own age group, to me, is not a good thing for your mental health. Um, I'm not saying that if you do do this, that it's going to be a silver bullet to solve mental health issues. I'm just saying that it makes you a better person. Mental health issues aside, developing social skills and physically being near someone and talking to them and interacting with them can be awkward if you don't know how to deal with it. But guess what? You can deal with it if you keep doing it. And I think a lot of kids these days and like a, a lot of parents these days, I'll, I'll say parents, not kids, because kids, they, they don't know. But parents will snatch your kids away from those situations as soon as they feel uncomfortable, as soon as they feel awkward. And they complain like, oh, I don't want to go. I don't want to try out for the team. I don't want to join the social club. I don't want to join the band. I didn't want to go home. You know, and that's that's normal for a kid to do that. But I think parents really need to push their kids to be uncomfortable so that they can know how to deal with being uncomfortable and be con- and be comfortable with who they are. Because how do you know who how do you know if you're comfortable with yourself if you've never been uncomfortable? It's a, it's a thought that I think some of these kids and parents need to learn from. Um, and I know personally, Buona, over the years, there was a lot of times where I didn't want to be around people. And I didn't want to be, you know, I just wanted to be a hermit. I didn't want to go outside. I didn't want to do anything. And I was made to go outside. My parents saw it early and it made me the person I am. Like I'm, I, I can be an introvert, but I can be the best extrovert you've ever seen in your life. I'm good with people. I can make friends like that. I learned it from my father. He taught me a lot of techniques just by me watching them, just how to deal with people. And it makes you a better person, but necessarily, you know, being a better person and being good at something doesn't mean you always have to be comfortable. You know, I think a lot of successful people in the world will tell you that a lot of things and a lot of breakthroughs they had in their life and in their success was overcoming that fear to break through a barrier to be something greater than what they think they could be. And that comes from being uncomfortable. You know, it's like, it's like lifting weights. It's like growing a muscle. It's going to hurt. But at the end of the day, when the pain goes away, you're going to be stronger as a result. So I think these millennials, I think their mental capacity and their mental or generation Z, whoever they're talking to, I think their mental workout skills are weak because they don't, they don't push themselves. they, 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 they pull back and they, they, they revert to the comfortable solo introvert lifestyle to where they're not pushing themselves from a social interaction standpoint. Humans need to be near each other. You can debate that until the cows come home, but I think humans need other humans. And when you're not, I mean, this whole idea of loneliness that they're talking about is that you miss people. And you think online people is going to replace that, and it actually doesn't. Check it out, guys. That's my soapbox of the day. <laughs> you would say today he's got the article. Millennials Generation Z connected with thousands of friends, but actually feeling all alone. And that concludes this episode of Tech Talk with Buona. Thank you, everybody, for coming by as we as we get back on the horse again. This is probably the 56th time I have been gone for three years and then come back and do a new episode of a, of a podcast. I'm kind of glad I'm going to do this. The initial plan is to do this every Friday. I've been doing tech. I'm going to do game chat one every Wednesday. I think the initial plan is just to do this every Friday on my live stream at twitch.tv slash one in the morning and just do all the production. one I usually stream. I think that's a good idea because I don't have a lot of time outside of when I stream and when I'm producing my content. I think if I make one of my streams a live recorded show, not necessarily a live show, but a live recorded show, this might think make things a little bit easier check out my live stream at twitch.tv slash born you can find me streaming there almost every day i stream every day except for wednesdays and sundays 10 a.m and then i go back again at 8 p.m eastern time you can find me on youtube at youtube.com slash buona instagram.com slash buona join our discord discord.gg slash buona i am all over the place go to buona.tv to see my blog posts and my podcast including this one tech talk with buona i think you'll have a great time if you do check out my sponsor corsair go to go.corsair.com slash buona buy some stuff it's good it's actually pretty good check it out check it out all right guys i'll see you probably next friday today is march 8th i'll probably be back next friday with a new show 
I'm hoping to produce this in a uh, in its own dedicated RSS feed. So for now, this is going to sit on an island on my post on my on my blog at wanted.tv slash podcast until I can get the feed and everything published to Spotify and everything else like Google Play and and on Apple iTunes and all the different stores like I have on Game Chat with Wanda. So if you guys can catch me, follow me. That will be awesome as well. You guys have a great day and I'll see you next time. Have a great day. Bye-bye.